Coming up next, the book of continues its discussion of Lewis, Lewis, Lewis Carroll. Carroll. Welcome to the booking. This is Nathan Robertson, your humble and obedient host, joining you for part two of our discussion on Gilbert Keith Chesterton. What do you think about that name, Brandon? I think it's a good name. A good name to abbreviate. A good name to abbreviate to, to G.K. Chesterton. Yeah. That's a little bit of the epigrammatic wit of Brandon Chastine right there, folks. There you have it. There you have it. <laughs> B.S. Chastine is how we would abbreviate your name. As a yeah, come up mine on the doesn't work so well. <laughs> Yours is not such a good name to abbreviate. <laughs> what about J.K. Menzel over there? That's a good Solid. one. Yeah. Uh, just kidding, Menzel. <laughs> or J.K. Rowling. Yeah, or what is it? Yeah. J.K. Simmons. He's a good actor. Yeah. Played Spider-Man's boss in the old Spider-Man. Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> I like to pronounce it Spider-Man. He's Brandon Chastine. He's the... Um, did I say what you are? He's a scholar who's a baller of reading. He's Jacob Menzel, J.K. Menzel, just kidding, Menzel, the pastor who's a master of reading. What time is it? Game time. <laughs> Uh, I was singing that song, and I felt maybe Jake was like a little sad that I was singing that song. Like, why did Nathan have to sing that song? That was a silly thing to do. So what I did is I made eye contact with him, and then he had to smile. (laughs) 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 Was I ashamed as I made eye contact with him? The answer is yes. (laughs) Was I ashamed at what I was putting him through? The answer is yes. But we have to make sacrifices for art. Art, like morality, consists in drawing... Or no, no, no. Morality, like art, consists in drawing the line somewhere. You know who said that? Give you one guess. Uh-oh. G.K. Chesterton. That's right. Our boy G.K. Chesterton. Well, I guess just in case... Uh, I'm sure a lot of people that listen to this podcast know Chesterton, love Chesterton, but there might be some people that really aren't as familiar with him. So maybe we can start our discussion by just answering the question of why anyone should care. Like... Who is actually G.K. Chesterton, Jake? Why are we doing an episode on this guy? You know what I mean? Yeah, well, G.K. Chesterton was a, I think I called him earlier, prophet of common sense, Mm -hmm. which I ripped off of somebody somewhere along the line. What he's doing is he's fighting the world that we live in now, 100 years ago. He's fighting it before it ever came to be. And so he's a, he's a man who saw clearly uh, the movements and the ways that things were shaping up and the way the direction things were headed and was warning against them. And so the main reason I read Chesterton is because, you know, when you want to think and there are certain writers that you read because they free you. They free you to think ordinary thoughts. They free you to think, to step outside of your culture and because he is a man who lived at these, you know, he he overlaps, like, as Brandon said in his context, the Victorian era and the beginning of modernity. He's he, He's got a foot in these two worlds, and he can see where we've come from, and he can see where we're headed, and he has the good sense to be able to write about it clearly. A lot of what he's writing about, I mean, I don't know how it would have hit at the time. Maybe people would have thought he was crazy, but... It just seems so prophetic, so clear that he understands and understood where the world was headed. And so you go back as somebody who's just trying to make sense of, gee, I kind of want to think that men and women are different, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? For example. For example, um, I kind of feel weird about the public school system. I kind of feel weird about any number of of things he's just like this breath of fresh air that just says the really obvious thing that you're not allowed to say or think and the fact that he says it in a fun and clever and colorful way doesn't hurt no it makes it fun and interesting and also validating because he's he's really smart Mm -hmm. and when you have somebody really smart saying the really obvious thing in a way that mocks anybody that would 
dare disagree with this obvious thing, then you feel sort of like free to breathe and free to think and free to begin to be critical of your culture, of the world that you live in. As somebody who is, I guess, far enough removed as an old dead guy to to not be a part of your culture, but to still be as clo- just right there on the edge, close enough that he saw it coming. And he was such a prophet. He really did see he everything. S- yeah, he saw it all coming. And he, so he was able to sort of, sort of be in our world, but not of it mm-hmm. in, that, in that sense. Of it enough to know himself. Um, but yeah, so the, the, that may not be the best or strongest pitch for why you should read Chesterton, but man, especially if you've not begun to think critically or to have uh, or to exercise any kind of discernment about the culture you live in chesterton's a really good place to start if you like c.s lewis i want to say like c.s lewis is a tepid i like c.s lewis too but we're talking about the difference between you know what um yeah like a rainstorm and a hurricane yeah (laughs) exactly (laughs) if you want the undiluted version of if you want the real stuff if you want the crack cocaine that c.s lewis is just the crappy whatever if you want lewis is lewis is chesterton light yeah that's one way to think of it lewis is chesterton light and so when you hit lewis for the first time as a 21st century american you know lewis can seem liberating and change and shift the way that you think about things and turn things on their head which is great more power to him that's an that's an he's a nice little gateway drug into a world of actually thinking freely and critically about the world you live in and chesterton's the next step and that can be a challenge because chesterton's much more difficult to read he's much more difficult to read he thinks in ways that we don't aren't used to thinking you actually have to trust him yeah. As a, as a, this was something that I found very difficult at first in reading some of his more extended essays. Is he can be so circuitous in how he comes to his points that you have to be willing to you know, to believe that he has a point and that it's yeah. going to come around and he's going to get there. And you have to, you know, be willing to to wade through his metaphors and and he's not afraid to just take like, oh, here's an interesting side point that I can now spend four paragraphs and pile another three metaphors on top of, and and then suddenly we're back in the main point, and it's like, whoa, yeah. And then he always manages to pull that little last thread, and then suddenly everything comes together, mm-hmm. and you you get it. And that's and I think that's also part of his point because he's so anti-modernist, he's not going to give you the point by point treatise. He's going to be as poetical about it as he can because he part of the goal is to have an effect on you. His writing style to impact you as much, you know, the the medium is the message, I guess. And so his way of crafting his essays is as much a part of his message as uh, many of the things that he says sometimes. Which, I mean, he uses a lot of hyperbole and paradox, as we've said. Mm -hmm. I think that can strike a lot of people as hard. It's different than the way that we express ourselves. It can also be difficult to wade through, but you just have to have some patience. And when we say paradox, we mean, like, what's an example of it? What's what's one of his famous ones? I have to find it. (laughs) A paradox would be saying something that doesn't, two things that don't seem to be able to coexist. They always, some of them are just kind of funny, like, here's one I found. I have little doubt that when St. George had killed the dragon, he was heartily afraid of the princess. Eh, it's a reversal on the, yeah. you know. I'm just looking at random Chesterton quotes on Chesterton.org. The first two facts which a healthy boy or girl feels about sex are these. First, that it is beautiful, and then that it is dangerous. There you go. Um, well, a famous, okay, here's a famous one by Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde always had these kinds of things where he would say, like, um, the only worst, the only thing that's worse than being talked about is be is not being talked about, or something like that. You know, yeah. um, mm-hmm. it, it makes a punchy little point through putting two conflicting ideas t- together in such a way that you realize, oh, actually, maybe they don't conflict, and the light bulb's supposed to go off in your head, and then you understand something about yourself. Yeah, ideally. I mean, the it's through synthesis, isn't that the logical method there these two things don't seem to coexist but you put them together and then they right through their synthesis you have some other meaning but sometimes he's so dense in those paradoxes and in those things those thoughts that he's putting together that you really have to work and sometimes it feels like i felt in algebra class the few times that the light bulb finally went off and i was like oh i understand the meaning (laughs) x equals three or whatever but we don't want to make him sound like a drudge because he is really funny. He he did get his start basically as a humorist. He Especially a, orthodoxy is just a really light, fun, yeah. but well, I want to it say, can be very paradigm-shifting 
though too i don't maybe light's not the right word yeah for it. it's like dense and fun it's like imagine a guy that, that's able to write these twitter epigrams but then packs these giant paragraphs full of them such that you kind of have to wade through it and all he's doing is trying to take all of your public school assumptions and flip them on its, their head and get you to look at the world upside down and think huh i guess i'm that was kind of dumb wasn't it is that the one that you would recommend if, if somebody's listening to this that hasn't read any chesterton was that the one you'd recommend they read? yeah i I've, I've been thinking about that i would certainly either orthodoxy or what's wrong with the world and it would really i think depend on where that person's coming from maybe seven or eight times out of ten i'd recommend orthodoxy as the first place to start um, what's wrong with the world is divided into sections and he does like you said talk about school talk about the women problem, which was uh, women's suffrage. At the yeah. Time, so I was just talking to a guy who's like a libertarian coming alive to thinking critically about cultural Marxism and men and women and all kinds of stuff. And uh, I was talking to him about Lewis and I was talking to him a little bit about Chesterton. And he was the kind of person I've, I've been still toying i haven't recommended chesterton to him yet but i'm kind of leaning towards what's wrong with the world first there and maybe it's just some things about him in particular i don't know Mm -hmm. but if you hmm. like fairy tales and and romance and the old classic sense of romance uh orthodoxy is a really inspiring book i think to read it it Mm -hmm. it lends excitement and vitality to the idea of being a christian just in a really beautiful way and if you think they're stupid yeah if you're uh dumb then yeah any um philosophy major out there should read orthodoxy i say that just because it always that seems to be the book that drives him the craziest orthodoxy drives yeah. philosophy majors crazy yeah well that's silly yeah orthodoxy is great it's fantastic yeah i mean it is a series of mental pictures and of metaphors it's 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 not i think the problem is you get the feeling that well chesterton is jolly he's happy yeah but he's not f- flippant mm-hmm like you had a quote earlier where he said that he's been accused of being flippant. Right. But he's not. Have we read that on the podcast or we were reading that earlier? We were reading it before we were yeah. recording. Yeah. But he was saying he's not flippant. And so what that means is that he does take everything very seriously. Mm-hmm. And so whenever I read Chesterton, I get the sense that, you know, you're walking through sunshine and meadows and it's pretty and it's nice. But like then beneath the surface, there are like some sort of giant creatures moving around or something that are very serious and danger and is lurking and it's, but it's very real. Right. Yeah. I don't know what other way to describe it. <laughs> Than to use a David Lynchian yeah. metaphor, <laughs> which could either be Dune or Blue Velvet. I don't yeah, know which yeah, David yeah. Lynch movie you're using I don't know. here. I wasn't thinking David Lynch, but <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. The d- collapse of society, the death of, nah, whatever. I was going to say another You know chest- what he didn't say? What didn't he say, Brandon? That quote about dragons. <laughs> <laughs> We've said a billion times yeah. on the bookening, that one? That's right. <laughs> who, who did say that, pray tell? Oh, I forget. So. Neil Gaiman. The guy who wrote Coraline, yeah. Yeah, the guy who wrote Gaiman. Coraline, Sandman. Uh, Neil Gaiman, the great Neil Gaiman. Not the great Neil Gaiman, actually. He's kind of a pervy weirdo, uh, or at least some of the stuff he wrote is. But what he did, he's a big G.K. Chesterton fan, actually, for whatever reason, which is weird because he's a total pagan. He really likes G.K. Chesterton's writing, which is interesting. What he did is he took a big essay where Chesterton basically makes the same point about dragons, and he condensed it into a really nice form that can then be put on memes and on the internet and instagrammed and i think he ascribed it to chesterton even. yes he'd be he definitely he would describe it to chesterton he, he's not wouldn't be ashamed to do that and actually that leads leads us into a topic that i wanted to discuss about gk chesterton here on our second episode of the bookening on gk chesterton which is the topic of people who are inspired by gk chesterton hmm. is that a thing <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> fact is, on the bookening, many, many times we have discussed the fact, we've expressed, dare I say, irritation with a certain sort of someone. And uh, it's we've done it so much that sometimes we've made it sound, I think, like we don't like C.S. Lewis or G.K. Chesterton because we're just like, oh boy, G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis. Tolkien. Tolkien, definitely. But... I thought maybe here, since we're in fact doing an episode about one of those gentlemen whom we often reference as kind of a lame thing for people to try to emulate, we could forever lay the subject to rest by talking about what it is we mean when we say whatever it is we say. (laughs) 
Jake is raising his hand. First things first, uh, G.K. Chesterton is an awesome person to be inspired by. Colossal genius. He's a total genius. He's brilliant. He's clever. He's funny. His use of metaphor and paradox and hyperbole is great. Great person to look to for inspiration. Not a great person to imitate for style. That's my claim. I'm sticking my claim in the ground there. Yeah. Planning, you're planning on your flag on the- Planning my flag. The island of don't rip off G.K. Chesterton's style. Be inspired, but don't imitate. Yeah. Usually it's a bad idea to try and purely imitate anyone. You look for inspiration, but eventually you don't want to just imitate. I remember when I was a kid, I read a book that we were about to read on the bookening. I believe our very next episode will be about it, which is Something Wicked This Way Comes. Um, Or maybe I didn't read it. The point is I read Ray Bradbury. And Ray Bradbury, as you may or may not know, has a very extravagant style. All of my writing suddenly for what it could be an essay on George Washington for history class, but it would suddenly have this extravagant style. Everything was a metaphor. There was lots of there be pirates in this world dialect and everything that, G- that Ray Bradbury did. I was trying to do. It was super lame. It was also kind of for forgivable because I was like a dumb 12 year old or whatever. Dumb 12 year olds going to do dumb 12 year old things. I eventually arguably outgrew that. 10 to 12 years ago when I was reading Chesterton for the first time, I was definitely trying to write like Chesterton. And part of the reason I was trying to write like Chesterton is because, hey, look, here's an old dead guy who is really smart and really clever and saying a lot of commonsensical things. I'd like people to think that I'm smart and clever. And so I will signal my smartness and cleverness by sounding like trying to sound like G.K. Chesterton and falling five million miles short of it (laughs) and sounding like a moron. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did for a while until I realized that that was really dumb. Right. And we see a lot of on the Internet. We see a lot of younger men generally who generally generally (laughs) we see a certain sort of young man. uh, Oftentimes he'll have a blog or he'll write for a a, 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 one of those. uh, He'll write for a URL. And uh, a website, a website, yes, that's the word. <laughs> <laughs> the website, he'll write on the world wide web and he'll write about Christian things. And he will have read Chesterton, and he, being a sensible young man, will have loved Chesterton. And so he'll write with all these similes and these metaphors and these, uh, and his thing, these phrases like, like so many. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he'll say, the problem of the modernist of the modern world is this, but actually it's this thing that sounds like it. Um, <laughs> um, and worst of all, oh, I hate this, alliterative titles. Only Ooh. Chesterton should be allowed to use alliterative titles. Yeah. No one that writes anything else should ever be allowed to call a, a blog post a name of an alliterative title. You guys know what I'm trying to say, so I won't even finish the sentence. Don't do alliterative titles. Not a, not a fan. Not a fan. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I'm talking like <laughs> talking like that. An old son of a sea biscuit here. That's, I'm the son of the sea biscuit this time. Right? You son of a sea biscuit. Uh, but uh, it's poserish and it's lame, and uh, we're not fans of it. And we make fun of it all the time on the bookening because it's fun to make fun of it. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's forgivable in people who are in high school or in junior high to want to imitate, and so they're trying to. Well, write. let's face it, Brandon. Today, a lot of kids don't learn to write in high school, so they're not even trying to imitate. They're well, not even trying to imitate until they're in their twenties. So. so, for anyone who's in high school and you happen to be listening to this, go ahead and imitate and try to learn. I mean, Ben Franklin learned that way. Yeah, imitation is a great way to learn. Yeah. So Ben Franklin, he has a great little, but he has a great little part in his uh, autobiography where he talks about he would just write out exactly what he read and certain things that he admired the prose. And then he would go and he would cut up the prose and he would try to put it back together. And the next step was to see if he could do it by memory. And then he would go and see if he could actually improve it. And so that's kind of how he worked out his writing style. And then eventually he was just a good writer. Right. <laughs> and so eventually you want to get to the point where you... <laughs> <laughs> Is that, la- that crucial last step. <laughs> yeah. That crucial last step. And most people... He well, was a genius, but eventually you get to the point where you can at least passably write something that's your own voice 
something. I don't want to s- not somebody else's voice. Yeah, I don't really blame little Nathan for ripping off Ray Bradbury or Brian Jacques. Jake's actually was one that I really liked. The Redwall stories. I would I would try and write things like that guy writes, which is this really kind of also a little bit over the top. So one one day I'll bring in some of my uh, early like junior high writing to the book thing. That would be fun. But um, I don't really blame myself for toying with Chesterton. No, me neither. I really blame don't. you if you were still toying with Chester. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. And what I see is people that get stuck there, and that's that makes me a little sad. A, because you always got to steal where no one else is looking. And right now, it turns out, Presterson maybe may not be having a resurgence in the popular world, but he's kind of having one in the Reformed and in the conservative Catholic world of the people yeah, that absolutely. we interact with. People Everybody at every church-owned coffee shop is reading Chesterton. Right. <laughs> exactly. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> there he is. There's a little bit more of the pa- patented, as I believe it, Jake says it's pronounced, uh, epigrammatic wit of... I, BS I just I just bowed, but nobody can see. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, everybody's stealing there, so it's it's a lame place to steal. If you're gonna steal, find somebody else, please. I'm just tired of reading Fo Chesterton. B, when you imitate and you imitate as much as some of these guys imitate, and it's obvious who you're imitating, you're do, you're not doing yourself any favors because suddenly everyone is going to judge you by the standard of that person. And it turns right. out G.K. Chesterton really was a genius. So if you want to rip off G.K. Chesterton, the best way to do it is to find a way to disguise it in such a way that people don't know that you're ripping off G.K. Chesterton so that they don't and therefore, not therefore make a comparison you. and therefore find you to be lame and stupid and inadequate. I mean, I, I just think that that's really important for people to realize like when you are just blatantly ripping somebody's style off then guess what you're calling attention to the fact that you're trying it's true of any art form it's true of painting it's true of acting yeah. if you just go out and try you're and inviting all... yourself to be held to that standard i remember when everybody said that christian slater was just doing jack nicholson and made fun of him for that whether that's true or false it's funny that christian slater is a fine actor but suddenly He's no Jack Nicholson, and suddenly the comparison was there, and somebody made the connection, and suddenly he sucks. You know, I don't know whether that was his fault or not in that particular case, but this is an example, a random weird example that <laughs> that's I. That's a very to... weird example. <laughs> that's a weird example. <laughs> you know, Christian Slater. He's like, hey man, I'm Christian Slater. That's my terrible Jack Nicholson, I guess. I don't know. Um, you actually were kind of doing Jack Nicholson earlier. <laughs> yeah, which is funny. my my son of a sea biscuit is closer to Jack yeah. Nicholson, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's true of painting. It's true of acting. It's true of performance of any kind it's true of comedians it's true of singers it's true of any art you could name you don't want to be known as a poor man's anything no and what's funny is a lot of the people who do this don't actually think they're stealing and this is where the fact that they'll read these people and they'll get very proud about the fact that they know that chesterton's a good writer and so then they'll think i can do that too and so then they'll go out and be very prideful in their writing and only just then sound like a cheap imitation yeah well yeah it's it's well it's a sin common of young men it's that if i understand it or can imagine myself doing it therefore i can yeah right it's like oh because i understand some of the genius of chesterton therefore i clearly can can do it myself if i can imagine myself writing as well as chesterton i and, like, and, and other and if i can imagine other people laughing and chuckling to themselves and thinking how clever i am yeah if you bring in some of your bad writing i'll try to find some of mine because i remember when i first found t.s Eliot and then also ulysses by james joyce and some of the stuff i tried to write after that it's just really funny it's yeah. just really stupid <laughs> stuff yeah, what we'll do we'll make a date and jake if you can find something for this is good mm-hmm. it'll be good uh we'll say on our year in review this year folks listen somewhere in those episodes those long meandering formless episodes where we talk about the, our best ofs and everything somewhere we will read some uh how far back should we go i know exactly the stuff i'll bring i think it's mine just, is going to be from high school junior high high school okay yeah I mean, it's, there's no fun beating up on a... I'm sure I did some dumb stuff when I was 10, but who cares? You yeah. Know? Um, yeah. I, I came across I the I Four Quartets by T.S. Eliot, and then I read Ulysses, and then I was like, man, I get this. <laughs> and I tried to do it, and it's really stupid. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I, I'm i going to be honestly embarrassed by this. It, it'll be some, fun. It'll but, be fun. No, it'll be fun. Because the one caveat I would have is... T- you can't just always it's not like we're trying to say that everybody has to be original in their writing no that's just really dumb too to think that you're gonna be just like this unique voice that no one has ever had before even chesterton wasn't that person Mm -hmm. because he had a little bit of oscar wilde all these other guys and influences he was a man writing for his time it's not bad to be influenced what you have to begin by doing is i mean i'm sorry to turn the bookening into a writing course but 
communicate clearly and think clearly. And style is a weird thing. Style's a really weird thing because it's always obvious when someone's putting it on and taking it off, when someone's posing with it. It's always obvious. And it's always obvious when it's just coming out of them. And the delightful thing about Chesterton is that you feel like you know the guy. The delightful thing really about any great writer is you just feel like you're burrowing into their brain and spending some time there. And it happens to be a brain that you like spending time in. And so anytime something feels poserish or like an act it's almost always people are just i don't know i don't know how i can tell the difference i don't know how to quantify the difference but i can tell i can tell when i'm reading a poser maybe there's some people that have fooled me sure but do you really want to try so you know what you do is you write clearly you communicate clearly if you're somebody that happens to enjoy metaphor or humor or whatever it is it will come out let's see part of the problem with the gk chesterton imitators is that they think it's clever and funny the way that Chesterton uses metaphors. But the reality is Chesterton uses metaphors to illustrate a point, Mm -hmm. not because everything he writes needs a clever metaphor to make him sound clever. Right. And that's where, you know, all good writing begins with good thinking. Mm -hmm. Clear writing begins with clear thinking. And Chesterton's actually, and it's, it's interesting to see how it develops. Like I said in the last episode, I think, Sometimes you can read his weekly articles and see it not as developed and not as good. But it, but by the time you get to some of his classic essays and his books and stuff, it's actually really well structured. It doesn't feel like it, though. It feels like he's just meandering. Meandering. But that's only because he's a very clever and very talented very writer. Very sophisticated. Very sophisticated writer who's managed to clothe his structure to disguise it, which is what you want to do. You want it to feel effortless. You want it to feel like a conversation, whatever. But that's all. Those are all tricks of the trade. He's not actually without good structure and without right. making a point. But then the imitators, right? They so often they have no structure whatsoever. They're not driving anywhere. But they do throw. Be, they're they're always sure to throw in that one metaphor just so they can murky the waters and make things a little bit more difficult. And yeah. that's just like. You know, you're not doing anything helpful to anybody there. Raymond Chandler, who was my favorite detective novelist, famously had a style that was very much ripped off. And you guys have heard the ripoffs. It's every detective thing where it says the dame walked into my office, hard boiled metaphors. <laughs> he invented those. He was he was ripped off by everybody and still is to this day. He said they his famous quote on it was they can only ever as a rule steal your th- your faults. And I think that that's actually really hmm. true. Because when he was doing it, it was a function of him. It wasn't because he loved hard-boiled metaphors. It was because he was trying to accomplish something else, and the hard-boiled metaphors came naturally. So when people just plucked that part of it out and started using it, it became fault. I don't know. I don't know exactly whether he's right about that or exactly how to quantify that or even explain that. But I think there's some truth to that. When you try and rip off someone's style, style is organic it's part of who you are it's part of how you think it's part of it comes out of what you are so if you try and just pluck it out of you can't divorce chesterton's metaphors from chesterton styles style has to be built on the fundamentals and on substance so there's fundamentals of good writing those come down to structure there's the substance actually having something to say and the style is it's your clever way of saying it but that i mean that's this is an across disciplines kind of thing, mm. and I always think about basketball <laughs> when we talk about it. I always think about basketball because I'm from Indiana, and that means that I grew up playing basketball every day. Indiana has a really great basketball culture with a lot of really great basketball coaches, and that means that in in other states have good football culture, or whatever. But Indiana is a small state, and it produces uh, the third most NBA basketball talent in the country, and I remember in college going to uh, going to the going to the gym and being there with with, with guys who were clearly more athletic than me had great style like mm-hmm. could do some really cool like and one basketball moves and stuff like that because they you know they, they'd watch Michael Jordan or Allen Iverson or whatever and and then you play a pickup game and they've got nothing and the reason they've got nothing is because they're all style mm-hmm. they're all quick ball handling it or whatever, but they don't, it things that maybe I can't pull off, but you know, they never learn the fundamentals, you know, so they, they can't handle a guy in the post. They can't, I'm making a really extended metaphor here that the men I'm in the room with may not 
really care about, but I think there are going to be people out there that get it. I so get it. I'm going to no, stay with. I'm going to stand it, by this metaphor. Well, and it, it's a metaphor that grows organically out of your experience, out of who you are. <laughs> it's built on, you know, you didn't see someone make a basketball metaphor and think I'm going to steal that basketball metaphor. Cause right, I think that's great. <laughs> your actual experience. Right, you lived a life. You, you well, that does get to something I was thinking of too. Is that the other thing that style, so style grows organically out of the person, it grows out of the fundamentals, and it actually also is bound in time. Mm-hmm. And so a, yeah. a good writer actually writes to his time. Right. And so Dickens would not be able to write nowadays. And a lot of people make the mistake of saying, well, Dickens is just a foolish writer. Well, no, Dickens was a Victorian writer. <laughs> right. Dickens, and, uh, you know, they would say, well, Chesterton is a bad, you know, he's overblown and stuff. Well, actually, if you read Shaw and you read Wilde and you read all these other guys, you realize he wasn't overblown. He was a late Edwardian writer. That's how they wrote. Yeah, Yeah, that's how they wrote. And he was really good at it. He was a master of it. But then you, so what a lot of the faults of these young guys, they will go back and they'll try to be Chesterton or they'll try to be Tolkien. And then it just sounds really stupid today. Yeah, they're writing in the Because they're not finding what's really valuable in those writers. But it's not them. Yeah, it's not them. And then it's also, they're not finding what's valuable to learn in Chesterton, in Tolkien, and then bringing it into a modern... I remember, uh, this is really common also in, in in young preachers. You'll have a, a young preacher and he'll, you always have the young preacher who's like, he's listened to John Piper's sermon, so he's going to imitate John Piper. And that's one thing. But then you have the guys that, you know, they get into the Puritans and then they try to preach sermons like the Puritans. I remember, I mean, it wasn't that long, it was a couple of years ago, a friend was really excited about this young guy uh, in, his, in his church who had begun preaching. What was exciting about his preaching was that he had learned to rip off Puritans. And it's just really (laughs) unnatural and really wonky and um, makes you feel really good and spiritual about you. And he's saying really great stuff. And so there's, you know, there's benefit there. Right. But he's not, he's not actually speaking as a real living being, human being, a man Mm -hmm. to the real living people in front of him in a way that shows this is not some kind of historical morality play. This is serious. Right. And, and it also, this sort of thing would have just infuriated Chesterton because he was a man you are in your time, you're bound to your time and your place, and you either love your time or your place or you're a monster. Right. <laughs> and so, <laughs> if you, so you preach to who surrounds you, and he would have seen some of what he had done as a sort of, I guess, a sort of preaching. I mean, he definitely was arguing. He was fighting. Right. That's the word I'm looking for. He was fighting. And so he was fighting with real flesh and blood men, using real words, real language of the time. And so if you're unwilling to use like the real language of the time, then you're just being precious with yourself and there's mm-hmm. nothing. Well, and, and You can and, still and, find a way to do really good writing with 20th century, 21st century right. <laughs> American <laughs> language. You can. You can find a way to do it. Yeah, and and, and the fact is we have very casual conversational syntax these days, and there's there's some stuff that's bad about that. There's some stuff that's good about that. But But even the things that are bad about that, there are ways to try to elevate. Yeah, there are ways to do good work. That are suited to our context. Right. Don't find like a really good movie critic. They will often do it well. I think what we're really talking about is the difference between pride and humility and humility is generally always present in some degree in a great communicator i think be it someone that communicates with their voice or with the written word because they have to care about whether their audience understands what they're saying and how their audience is responding and they don't want to be consumed by that and there are places maybe where you're willing to challenge your audience or even anger your audience depending on who your audience is but you have to care about them you have to care about them and when you're just putting on a style to show them how elevated you are how awesome you are how large your frame of reference is that's not actually caring about your readers that's not actually doing any work for them that's not making it easier for them to understand what you're trying to say that's not making it i mean i don't think it's making it more entertaining or more funny for them personally speaking your mileage may vary on chesterton ripoffs but i think if you're really going to be good in any discipline you have to i mean even the most arrogant sports guys like Muhammad Ali or Michael Jordan or whoever, I think probably had a certain kind of humility when it came to their discipline because they, Oh man, they had to know, they had to know how to make themselves better. Right. Well, uh, those guys were, were as arrogant as, as it, as it gets, but, but man, they also 
were the hardest working guys. At the fundamentals, right? A- absolutely at the fundamentals. You know, Michael Jordan was a guy that you would find in the gym doing suicides and working on his free throws. And he was not going to give you any competitive edge over him. He was not going to be outworked. And so that meant that he was going to outwork on the fundamentals more than any NBA rookie ever would. And that was just part of it. You you don't get genius in any, any realm without uh, a, this combination of massive talent and a, and raw talent and ability and really great circumstances mm-hmm. and incredible hard work and self-discipline and the the ability to to find and see and the humility to find and see your weaknesses to pinpoint them and to go at them as hard as you can and to treasure and value every single person that can draw out or expose a weakness in you and guys like that they live they live to dare you to find a weakness. Mm-hmm. And if you do, they're going to come back in the in the next the next time they see you and they're going to have fixed that problem and they're going to make it very clear to you that that problem is fixed. Maybe humility is not the best word for it. If not, I don't know what it is. But it's a self-knowledge. It's a self-awareness and an ability to stand outside of yourself and see yourself for what you are. So I guess that a good word for that is humility. And I think that that's what a lot of posers that are young and adopt a style and unfortunately it can happen that they get old and they never really leave that style behind and so it's just lame if you want to be a great stylist that's not a bad i don't don't want to discourage anybody that wants to be the next chesterton chesterton's a great model to have it's great that he was funny that he appreciated what was common to all of humanity that he was able to create these great visual and verbal pictures of things. Uh, he was a very endearing guy. He's not being an awful anti-Semite. When um, he's not doing that, yeah. <laughs> but you got to figure out how to do that for your generation. And that me, if you if you if you want to be that guy, and if you've been if God's blessed you with the talent, then I say uh, God bless you and uh, go do it. But you're gonna have to do it not by being G.K. Chesterton, but by figuring out with humility and with grace and with hard work how to do the things that you like about G.K. Chesterton for a new generation. So yeah, anything else to say about that? I kind of want to think it's worth saying that a student's not greater than his master and if you're only ever just imitating somebody then you should just know that you're you're a nobody that you're not yeah i, I think that is worth saying what was that you chesterton saying? was a genius because he was unique the one thing his imitators will never be is unique and so they'll never rise to the level of genius that he has a student is not above his master and maybe you think it's it's pretentious to try to aspire to be better than Chesterton, and you're probably right. But to uh, aspire to be as unique as he is is not something to scoff at. That's a that's a worthy pursuit. Yep. I think the way you'll do that is by, you know, as the only one that's truly unique is God. All the rest of us are just taking the raw materials that he gives us and reconfiguring them and recombining them in a, a billion ways. What we call creativity is actually just humans taking stuff and rearranging it. And some people have the ability to arrange it in a very quick, facile way, and some people less so. So you're always going to have inspirations, and you're always going to have people that inspired you, and you're always going to have things that you like and things that you want to be like. You have to be able to put these things together in uh, new ways. And, you know, uh, be yourself. I mean, it's kind of lame, but to say it that way, I don't know how else to say it without sounding like Mr. Rogers, but uh, there's only one you, you know? I mean, you can figure out a way to do stuff just just, just a little bit different than old G.K. Chesterton. What's Mr. Rogers? Doesn't he have a song about that? I'm sure he does. So that's why we always pick on G.K. Chesterton, right, fellas? That's right. Or whatever. We don't actually pick on G.K. Chesterton. I want to talk uh, just a little bit, and this is really maybe the only other thing worth saying about Chesterton. I, I guess maybe I'll open up the floor. Is there anything else that you guys want to say about Chesterton before we're done? You were talking earlier about his fiction. I just want to say I've only ever read one thing. Which is? Man Alive. I've not read that. What is that even about? It's a guy who... Uh runs off and then comes back and courts his wife and marries her all over again multiple times um, as though, but you don't really know that. That's what I remember. I, I read all, I mean, I read a really hard burst of Chesterton 
10 right. to 12 years ago and have come back to some of the essays, but I haven't come back to that one. That- I, th- I think it begins with man found having two legs. If ever you've wondered why Toby, our friend Toby Sumter's blog is called Having Two Legs, it comes straight from that particular Chesterton work. Do you, do you, was it obnoxious in the way that uh, maybe you weren't ob- obnoxed by it, but was did it have some of that quality that I was hating on last episode of like, oh no, it's could be a good story, but I instead didn't feel he's that. being didactic. I don't remember feeling that. I remember just thinking it was sort of like a fast-paced, surreal whirlwind that was... I didn't quite know what to make of it, but it was kind of neat that the guy was so committed to living as though, you know, living alive, awake to the world that he would run off and then come back and court his wife all over again and or whatever. I don't know. That's the way a lot of his fiction works is it's him just revealing the strangeness of the world. Right. Yeah. And so he wants you to marvel. And, I think that's the plot. Yeah. Marvel and be amazed at it. So like I'm thinking of the club of queer trades, the whole plot of the whole plot of that book is that this guy has a friend who knows of all these strange companies that are making money in weird ways. Mm-hmm. And so there's this one guy who's building houses, like actual tree houses for people to live in. And so he goes and he shows him this place. There's this other guy who's like kind of got, have you ever seen um, The Game with Michael Douglas? Yes. He's got kind of that company going on where he'll like put you in the middle of this adventure if you pay him enough money. And so it's just that, and it's strange and it's weird and it's surreal and it's fast. And that's that's kind of the feeling of his better fiction. Yeah, that was the feeling of Man Who's Thursday until he messed it all up with that. I don't know. I think we should do Man Who's Thursday sometime. I'd be really interested to see how I like it all these years later and how Jake likes it, having not read it. <laughs> We're going to do a novel that's kind of similar to The Man Who Was Thursday, so Till We Have Faces. Yeah, 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 Till We Have Faces. It's got that sort of weird, surreal ending. I don't remember being disappointed by that one. I actually don't remember what the ending is on that one. It's, um, it's a doozy. <laughs> it's a doozy. <laughs> <laughs> but hmm. okay so larger point the only reason we decided to talk about chesterton is all is because uh, actually it is interesting that did did we all have a short intense love affair with chesterton and then kind of put him to the side for a while basically i sure did that's what i did yeah sounds like that's what you did is there something to that is there something we should explore is there something inherent in chesterton that would make one do that or something i sure think he's worth coming back to but uh, i think he's worth coming back to too but i I really I haven't al- as much. Yeah, I really. That's why I do. But. I think the main thing is like this beautiful discovery of a guy out there who is like sane, right? And you 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 drink from you you've spent your whole life drinking so much insanity that he's just like this oasis. But he's in some ways he feels like just that you're in the desert. There's here's an oasis, but you got to keep moving stuck in edwardian england with chesterton you've got to as fun as that would be you can't you need to keep moving and so he's something i think of a i don't know maybe not but he seems to be more of a a good stop along the way and one worth revisiting from time to time come a guy worth coming back to and just being reminded of in sort of i don't know recalibrated like if you want to recalibrate yourself to the insanity of the of modernity and the way god actually made the world and chesterton's a good guy to come back to Mm -hmm. but i feel like you can absorb enough of him well it's almost like he's potent enough that you drink that draught and you drink deeply and it's powerful and it's helpful sticks with you and then it sticks with you it's like you carry a little piece of it's sort of like he does the work of doing some calibration and then you can carry that with you you don't have to go back and read it because chesterton's just always your old friend after that and there's almost no point but it's that's like a compliment you know most writers i'd say i'm not going back to them because they were thin or didn't really give me that much so i took what was valuable and i moved on with chesterton it's like there's an enormous load of riches he's sort of never not standing on his shoulders after you've yeah that's a good way to put it I'm getting two images. Right. One is <laughs> he gave he gives you the matrix pill and he wakes you up. Right. But, you know, eventually you have to walk away from Morpheus. But right. you've, you're always owing your life to Morpheus. Right. <laughs> or he's like the uh, Plato's philosopher guy who goes down into the cave. And takes you and out. And he cuts your um, chains. Mm-hmm. And so you're always thankful for the fact that he cut your chains. And you always go back to him to remind you why he cut your chains in the first place. Right. But... It, the whole point was to cut your chains so that you could go and do other yeah. things. And, it, it's almost, and I think he would be perfectly fine with that. Oh, yeah. I think, I think that's a really, I think it's a really that. great metaphor. 
Yeah. It's like he taught you how to see the world and you just, your job is to go see the world. It would almost, it's actually one of the things maybe that I don't like about the people that get stuck writing like Chesterton or living their lives kind of of Chestertonians. It's like the greatest respect, you know, if old GK is up there looking down from the clouds on us, the thing that he would probably want is for you to take what's valuable about him and live it. Yeah. It's exactly what he would want. He would want you to, he would, I think he would be shocked and surprised if you were to spend your whole life just reading his books. He would want you to go and read other things. He would want you to go out and play with your kids, have uh, picnics with them under the table. Get yourself like, a stick, a universal. Yeah, pretend like you're the king and they're the subjects, whatever he does in that one book where he says you got to play act with your kids. Mm-hmm. He'd want you to go and watch Total Eclipses. He'd want you to go and do all these things, mm-hmm. not worry so much about his... Because he's got one big point that he makes, and he makes it so resoundingly well that it's like shakes you. Mm-hmm. But eventually, you just gotta move on. And you get to move on, having been strengthened by. Yeah, that. I don't mean just move on. Like, uh, uh, no, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, what's the, what's the big point? What's the big point? He makes one big point. You said he makes one big point. What is it? <laughs> I already talked about that. <laughs> what was the big point? In um, orthodoxy, I think he gets at the point by saying that maybe what's the maybe the big secret of the world is God's laughter. Isn't that what he says? Is that the last line of orthodoxy or something like that? Oh, he's got it right there. Jake's going to tell us what the last line in orthodoxy is, and presumably... I think his big point is that the world is... And it's a paradox. There was some one thing that was too great for God to show us when he walked upon our earth, and I have sometimes fancied that it was his mirth. His mirth, yeah. His joy. And I think that's kind of the point that he keeps making, is that by, you know, you are very much flesh and blood in this world in a very particular place and time. And because of that, you have responsibilities and duties to that place. But those responsibilities and duties are given weight because of something that's much bigger than everything else. And that's kind of the paradox that he wants to open up to you is that you're limited and you're bound, but at the same time, you're a part of something that's enormous. And so go on and live and be happy and responsible and not a Catholic. Right. Well, that's what he would want. I know, but not a Catholic. Turns out you can be a good Calvinist and a good Chestertonian too. Yeah, because in the end... Turns out if you want to be a good Chestertonian, you kind of need to be a Calvinist after all. That's the big irony there for him. (laughs) Yep. The joke's on you, (laughs) G.K. Chesterton. Otherwise, you're just going to have like your rosary path. Did you see that over in uh, that Catholic school here in town on the east side? They've got this gravel path they just formed with all the little statues. No. And it's a rosary path. Mm. So. Well, G.K. Chesterton. He'd have been out there. Yep. Waddling around with his cape and his sword <laughs> stick. <laughs> Fun fact. There are, he did a, sh- a show for the BBC. This is something I forgot to mention in context on our last episode. Uh, he did a show for the BBC. I'm not sure how much of it is still available, but you can find audio recordings of him. He had a very thin, kind of reedy, not particularly bombastic voice. He always thought of himself as something of a disappointment because he it was hard for him to live up to the legend. There's a story of him going to give a speech, I think, in America, and the, the guy got up to introduce him and said, yeah, the great G.K. Chesterton. And Chesterton got up and muttered something like, after the whirlwind, the still small voice. Not, not, not a voice to match the great uh Santa I think Claus-like that I think, I think that's one of the only video recordings of him I think you can find it yeah he's talking about Kipling I think maybe it's a recording for the Kipling Society I don't know it's huh. something it's something like that it's in, him lecturing in America um that's like I gotta go find that yeah or send it yeah it's uh it's uh, it's easily I mean I will it's like when I found Flannery O'Connor reading a good man is hard to find oh that's fun that's amazing did she do a good job yeah Tolkien does a good job with uh the Hobbit stuff. Um, you finding it, Jake? Film of G.K. Chesterton at Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. Let's hear a little sample of his voice. Is that how you say it? Worcester? Worcester. 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 I never know when the homosexual might be about. <laughs> Down this way, Ray. Since you are the one of the foremost crusaders in the modern world of letters, we wish to adopt you into the humble rank of the Holy Cross Crusaders. I have to thank you for this very great honor, and I do so with all my heart. 
I can only say that I am not much of a crusader, but at least I am not a Mohammedan. (laughs) (laughs) And many people will testify to the fact. Uh, I should like to take this opportunity of thanking you all for your enormous kindness, and especially Father Earl for having received me so hospitably today. Not a bad voice. No. Somebody said, I saw this on the great Wikipedia, that... uh, if he'd lived, he probably would have became, become quite a famous broadcaster. His his talks that he gave on the BBC were quite popular. He would improvise a little bit, go off script, make it real warm and conversational. He was the first podcaster, Brandon. We're just carrying the torch. What? Um, maybe we're, since he's a racist, we're carrying the tiki torch. Old G.K. Chesterton. The tiki torch. <laughs> oh, racism. You know, white supremacists use tiki torches. I didn't know that. They do. <laughs> no. Did you watch... The, any of the Charlottesville stuff? Or the, well, I didn't catch on that they were carrying tiki torches. Yeah, I know. It, it kind of became a, a thing. Huh. Oh, that is too bad. What's that? We have a lot of tiki torches. You do? At yeah, my house, yeah. Uh-huh. And my son, we also have an old Confederate flag that we made when I was a homeschooler. And one day I came home and <laughs> Jack was running around the yard wearing it as a cape. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I said, yeah, maybe we should put that away. <laughs> Jake, do you agree with Brandon's assessment of the one big thing that Chesterton had to say? Sure. <laughs> he said, uh, live local, think global, or something like that, right? That stupid thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of always. <laughs> I trapped Brandon. He had to tell us what the big yeah, point was. I, said- <laughs> I think of him as a prophet. Yeah. And I actually think of him as a guy that I, I think of myself, like if we're all shipwrecked on an island because our generation drove the drove our ship into rocks gk chesterton was the old man saying don't go out today there's a storm he was the guy who saw it coming he saw i mean he probably would not be surprised by transgender ba- bathrooms honestly he was the guy that understood where modernism was going to take us and he gave a warning and history has largely forgot him which is sad. I mean, I think a, a, a truly great history would say, here's the guy that told us what not to do and where not to go, told us where it would all lead. We chose to blow him off, and look what happened. Everything went wrong with the world. Everything went wrong with the world, leading us to the world we made. Now available on iTunes. <laughs> so much that we could talk about with Chesterton, but dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, but if we try to talk about everything, we would be madmen, right? We? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, um, Chesterton is just somebody that, that. What do you want to say to the people out there about Chesterton? I mean, what's what's the moral of the story on this guy? Why should people care? <laughs> what's your favorite thing that Chesterton ever wrote? What's your favorite? Oh, I'll tell you my favorite line. Can I tell you my favorite Chesterton line? Yeah, you know what it is. Is that one about dragons? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's my favorite Neil Gaiman line. Oh, where is it? My favorite G.K. Chesterton line. Did you just Google my favorite G.K. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. I love this one. This one actually really made me laugh when I first read it. However, many years ago, I think it appears in What's Wrong with the World. Ten thousand women marched through the streets, shouting, "We will not be dictated to," and went off and became stenographers. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. It's a good. It's a, it's a, it's a, see what I mean about it? Be a good tweeter. I, uh, twi- I think that's probably wor- less than uh, 160 characters right there. Yeah, too bad he couldn't be around to tweet. <laughs> yeah, too bad he couldn't be around to tweet. Or too bad Twitter couldn't have been around in Edwardian England. Yeah. <clears throat> good enough reason right there to create a time machine. Exactly. <laughs> Though, if you go back in time with your iPhone, would Twitter still work? <laughs> But it's a good question. <laughs> Folks, write to us. Send us your thoughts on whether uh, G.K. Chesterton would uh, be able to use my iPhone to tweet when, after I invent a time machine. Obviously, what I'm going to do, I'm going to get a Triceratosaurus Rex. No, no, no. I'm going to get a Triceratops. I'm going to ride it up to Jane Austen's house and be like, will you marry me? And then we'll both go and we'll meet uh, old G.K. Chesterton. We'll get him to send some tweets. And we'll get oh, Jane man. to send some tweets. She'd be, I'm going to be like the lord of Twitter. Like, I'm going to be the Twitter master. I'll have Jane Austen 
and I, I, I can, uh, you know, send some trisana, uh, Triceratops picks, too. Well, you just gave me the idea for my first novel, <laughs> The Twitter Master. <laughs> the Twitter Master. The story of Nathan Alberson. <laughs> <laughs> Probably ends with some dumb didactic point about how Twitter doesn't work. You had something to say? Did I buy you some time and you thought of something great to say? <laughs> You looked like a man with something to say. What I think what here's what I think. I think it's a sin to write or preach or speak about God or theology in a boring way. And it's not that God needs your help because he's boring and so you have to be interesting. It's that to speak about something so exciting and exotic as Orthodox Christian theology in a way that makes somebody yawn is the kind of thing that requires a PhD. Like you have to be both super sophisticated and super foolish to do it. And yet we all manage to be just clever enough and just foolish enough to do it. (laughs) Chesterton is a little bomb planted right there to blow that up and uh, bring romance back to the world and the world as God made it and bring romance back to uh, historic Orthodox Christianity. Shoot, that's a dumb quote to read. Oh, well. Fail. I thought it would be nice to read a quote. <laughs> that quote sucks. <laughs> Let's be done. <laughs> Man, read Chesterton. Just go read him for yourself, yeah, kids. Find your own quote. <laughs> find your own quote. I'm not going to read you a quote. It's not our job. Go to patreon.com forward slash the booking to support the booking. Give us money, listen to and consume our products, and be enriched and fulfilled by them. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye to the listeners, Brandon. Goodbye, listeners. Say goodbye to the listeners, Jake. Goodbye, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I don't know. It's 2 a.m. What do you want? Which bad listeners? <laughs> I'd be back. <laughs> I'm going to start wearing a cape and have a sword stick. (laughs) I know where you can get a great Confederate cape. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I feel a little small for you. (laughs) 